Okay, let's get started. Welcome to the last session of the last day of this exciting summit. And I hope we can add some exciting stories of our customers um, to conclude this summit and session. Uh, my name is Bernd Herd. I'm a technical marketing engineer working for NetApp in our competency center in Waldorf, which is SAP's headquarter, supporting SAP. And with me here is Mark Kodera. Uh, maybe, Mark, you can start and tell us a bit what we've done. Yeah, thank you, Bernd. Um, so basically, we have a really good relationship uh, um, uh, with uh, NetApp about uh, OpenStack contribution and uh, uh, feature re um, development. And we wanted to use this session to um, show how we uh, um, um, run our, our project, how we share our requirements, and how we get them implemented. And at the end, let's say, um, um, uh, this is beneficial for the whole community here. Um, we will run one example um, of a feature that we were developed all together, um, and we show a demo at the, uh, at, at the end. Um, at first, I will just present what we are doing with OpenStack uh, at SAP, what's our aim, and, um, and what are the uh, projects that we are focusing on, and then we will go in more detail about the work that we uh, both to, uh, do together. Um, Basically, uh, SAP has a lot of internal clouds, so uh, more than 20 internal clouds, somehow self-written, self-maintained, and all that. And there was a decision that we move all these little, small clouds um, to uh, OpenStack um, as a API contract. So basically, all these, these little tiny clouds, and maybe some of them are really huge, um, do have special requirements and orchestrate different kind of uh, uh, virtualization. Um, so basically, also OpenStack needs for us to support uh, uh, a lot of uh, those workloads. So what we are underneath uh, uh, OpenStack support as hypervisor is uh, KVM. I think this is uh, something that uh, everything considers. But we are also supporting VMware as, uh, as hypervisor. And we are also big interested in bare metal um, because, all, uh, because our HANA workloads in particular have a high demand on, um, on performance. So. Um, as an overview, we are, we are, so we are um, spending efforts also in the community and, uh, uh, and developing features, um, basically on, on components that we see a strategic uh, um, reason and uh, also the need that, that, uh, uh, that we need to be involved. So uh, basically for, for projects that are not mature enough to be in an enterprise cloud. So Manila for, is one example where we spend uh, a lot of development efforts all together, also with NetApp, um, to get the things implemented uh, for, for our cloud at the end. Um, so I will hand over to Bernd. He will mm. tell us a bit more about um, why SAP needs shared file systems in Manila. Well, that's a good point that I should explain that. But <laughs> yes, SAP, um, almost every SAP system has a need of shared file systems. That's true for a HANA system like you see here, uh, when in a scale-out environment, executables, trace files are located on, uh, on a shared file system. Um, like the HANA shared. Uh, on classic SAP, whether it's an Oracle or other databases, usually sub MNT is well known to put all the trace files on it. But in addition to those typical shared file system use, use types, um, using, using NetApp in a, in a classical environment also allows you to use NFS as, as a base for putting the database files itself on it. So the data and the lock. So, uh, and this has additional benefits. So uh, since you have an NFS server underneath, it's easier to manage, easier to relocate, uh, easier to scale, and uh, using a tool such as SAP's Landscape Virtualization Manager, it has built-in NFS features to relocate and move things around. So there's a need of uh, a shared file system and a good place to position Manila. Um, when we look at enterprise, typical enterprise requirements, um, we look here in that example at a massive scalable cloud, 10K tenants. Uh, so there are a lot of 
additional demands or specific demands on enterprise, we, we use three areas out of, out of many to point it out. So security, so when we look at the tenants, they should be isolated uh, on all the different layers, uh, including network. Uh, if we look at classical SAP applications, such as an in-memory database, high demand on memory, CPU, and I.O. performance towards the storage is very important. And if you look at that huge scale, automation is important. You could imagine you, you don't want to, to set up for all the 100 tenants, uh, isolated storage setups, uh, dedicated. That should be automated and, and running. So comparing those parts to, um, to Manila, that means in the security area, we, we want to use the secure share network, secure access. We want to use massive scaling, so we, we have to solve the VLAN, VXLAN, and other limitations. Um, in the performance areas, we want to have the maximum throughput for our database and log files sitting on NFS, so we look at jumbo frames to enable it on all the different layers from, from network down to the storage. Uh, we look at a selection or pre-selection of uh, protocol types, whether it's NFS v3, v4, um, and we use share types for selecting volumes or, or storage backends depending on the database requirements. And of course, in the automation areas, we switch to managed shared servers instead of manual config configuration. And in addition, we, of course, we want to use features that are built in Manila, like snapshot or volume clone, but we want to use it on a level where the storage backend did all the jobs and, and get it done fast and reliable. Um, with those requirements, we build that collaboration, as you mentioned, and uh, we have the goal to put that actively into the community. So putting Manila uh, blueprints, feature requests, we identify and report and fix bugs in, in, in the different areas throughout our journey. And we also have set up this partnership uh, from NetApp development, so having constantly uh, sharing with the uh, NetApp developers, core developers of the Manila teams. We have a local support team and SAP itself did, did a lot on coding. So that was a perfect way of collaborating. And to give you a, a small example, so we have a public wiki page where we collect all the enterprise requirements on a shared file system. So we, we select what's the issue we identified, uh, a description on it, a priority from our perspective, an assignee, some reference over reference to a launch pad, to uh, blueprints, whatever it came out. We even uh, have accomplished quite some over the time. Some are still outstanding or planned for Okata or even later. So um, that is basically a list where we collaborate. And one of the examples we want to show you is the hierarchical port binding, and that's, Mark, your part. Yeah, sure. So, so basically, as uh, Brent mentioned, we wanted to have a full automated cloud. So this means we don't want to care if some uh, if Manila creates a share um, uh, about the networking in between. We want to have a full automation that the virtual machine connects uh, to the storage and to the, its part in in the storage. Um, so um, basically, what what we are uh, developed and this is already part of the Newton release, so um, it's completely landed and fully uh, ready to be used. Um, so basically, before Newton, Manila created neutron ports, but didn't care about actual binding these ports to uh, the network fabric. So uh, this, uh, this changed here, and um, what basically is, uh, is done here, Manila creates a neutron port um, and waits until the network fabric does a real binding, uh, creates the network connectivity from the storage cluster to the virtual machine. So um, this is, let's say, the first step. It's the binding step that, uh, that we implemented. Um, the next step is the massive scale. The thing is, um, in particular, uh, the NetApp storage and other storage boxes do have the issue that they are not supporting overlay networks like VXLAN. Um, so we need to have at the storage and uh, VLAN um, uh, segments. 
So, and uh, there was the other question. So, we have we will have more than 4,000 uh, networks. So, how can we support that? So, the next step of the binding was to also support hierarchical port binding. So, this this means all the magic is done in the network fabric. So, uh, at the end, um, um, at the outcome of the of the of the switches, there will be just VLAN. Uh, uh, segments, uh, but in between there is a VXLAN uh, under the hood in the network fabric. Um, this sounds maybe easy, and uh, uh, and maybe the question is why is Manila concerned? But uh, uh, in, in particular, Neutron uh, has a, a different way of binding for multi-segments, so we also needed to take care here. Um, so what we what we did is we created a, a test lab that. Um, to, to reproduce all the um, all these features, and uh, we, we will show you now a, a small demo um, how this works. So basically, what we have really a small set of, of pieces. We have a compute node x86 server, just a Cisco switch, and uh, an adapt cluster, um, basically all connected with uh, two ports. Um, the compute node itself to have the Cisco uh, uh, neutron driver activated. This means um, uh, it's fully automated. Uh, the Cisco provisioning is fully automated. So um, let's 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 have a uh, look um, uh, to the movie. So um, basically, as I said, we have this uh, um, neutron driver active. So um, in, within the neutron configuration, we will we'll see there is configuration of the IP address to SSH to the switch. So this is Cisco configuration. Um, this means if you create a network, and DevStack in particular creates a default uh, um, a network, um, it, it will assign a VLAN segmentation ID on it. And if we have a look to the switch, then it will be automatically uh, configured. So now we are, we are SSHing to the switch and, uh, and, and have a look. So automatically, by creating a network, um, this, uh, uh, this segmentation ID is put to the switch port. So you don't see any VLAN range or whatever. It's just this particular VLAN that is assigned. So if, in, if you create a new network, then there will be another assignment. Um, so and now how is Manila concerned here? Um, here, uh, you need to give M Manila the idea where the connection is in the switch to the, to the, to the uh, storage cluster. So if, you, if Manila creates a port, it will be also adding this information uh, to the non neutron port create. So automatically, um, the switch will be reconfigured. So what we see here now is just that the connectivity to the new network, uh, NetApp system is completely blank. So we don't have any Manila share and nothing. It's just configured uh, uh, as, uh, as none. So there is no VLAN co already configured. So what we are doing now is creating a network um, uh, in Neutron. Uh, this will get a new segmentation ID. and. After that, we will create a subnet. So what we see here is the segmentation ID 2339 assigned to the network. And now we, create a, uh, um, now we have to create a subnet. So we created a new network storage 2. We will create a subnet with a IP range. So this will trigger now um, the Cisco driver um, that that the compute node ports will be reconfigured. So it has nothing to do with, uh, you see now we have two VLANs automatically provisioned on the switch. So that's the usual Cisco driver uh, magic. But now we create a share, and now this, the, the right uh, port channels for the NetApp fast, uh, cluster needs to be also automatically uh, reconfigured. So basically, now we create uh, a share net shared network with, this, uh, with the storage two network. Then we will create a share on this network. So basically now under the hood, Manila will create neutron ports with inf given information how the, uh, NetApp file, uh, the NetApp filer is connected to the switch. So it will take a while until um, the uh, storage is available. So and if we now have, again, a look to the switch, we will see that 
not only the ports for uh, for the uh, for the compute node is configured, but also the two ports for the NetApp is automatically configured, and just the one VLAN that is for the storage network that is used for Manila for the Manila share. We now have a look at the uh, uh, NetApp filer. We will see that there is an open stack. Uh, uh, there is an yeah, open stack SVM spawned automatically to to be secure, and we see here also that the networking part that this v segmentation ID is also configured automatically in the NetApp filer. So we have here a completely end-to-end -end automation from storage and also networking. So uh, Manila does the needful that everything is automated uh, uh, just to connect a virtual machine to the storage. And this was, let's say, a big part of our work uh, within uh, uh, the last cycle So, you want to give some overview about the next steps? Yeah, maybe? next steps. Uh, so we will focus for for the Okata on on using the share migration, which is of course important in a, in a large scale. You mu must be able to to add resources and to relocate uh, the shares. So that that is a part we we focus with a pretty high priority, and we of course continue the partnership to uh, to work with. Uh, with the community and, and together with SAP and, and the NetApp development team and still uh, work on the wiki and invite to have a look there and even uh, add other enterprise requirements to it. Um, so with that, uh, just a little hint, there are blog posts out that explain other requirements like uh, looking for the MTU size to get, get that solved from Neutron down, down to the storage. Um, and with that, we like to hand over to the next presenter. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for attending this session. It has been a long week, so we we'll really appreciate that you are still here in the last slot of the last day of this summit. My name is Lourdes Peñas. I'm the technical account manager for BBVA. And the goal of this presentation is to explain the challenges that the BBVA storage team are facing to build an agile technology platform to meet the digital transformation goals and how NetApp is helping them to address those challenges. We also have a challenge and is to deliver this presentation with three speakers and almost 30 slides in only 20 minutes, so let's do it. This is the agenda for today and the first two topics will be covered by Luis Sánchez Vidal. Luis is the head of storage at Architecture and Global Deployment in BBVA. Luis, it's your time. Thank you. Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to explain um, why a uh, bank as our, and especially a uh, storage department, is here in this journey to 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 open stack. So, uh, first of all, uh, as I said, um, BBVA is a global financial institution um, that is providing financial services in 35 countries to 67 uh, million customers. Um, we are the biggest bank in one of the biggest banks here in Spain and the biggest financial institution in Mexico with our bank that is called Bancomer. We also have a, a presence in uh, South America as well as uh, in the Sunbelt region of the United States. And we are one of the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest uh, shareholders in a guarantee bank in Turkey. So the bank, uh, sorry, the world have changed, the rule have changed and also, therefore, the way we are doing business, um, especially in our sector, the financial sector, uh, have changed. In one hand, we have uh, a post-crisis, we have a very regulated um, environment, and also, uh, due to technology, we have now uh, other companies uh, that are, um, um, that, um, are um, um, well, like, uh, I, I want to say that, we have other companies, uh, uh, startups and uh, fintechs that uh, make us evolve because we have a, a very complex uh, environment. 
So uh, the bank is uh, aware of that and uh, is anticipating and we are, uh, because we consider that technology is our key factor, we are um, addressing this, this thing. So uh, starting in 2007, we began to deploy our platform and now we are adapting it to the new uh, exponential growth uh, of the market. So we consider uh, cloud as key f the key factor. So we start our um, journey to the, to the, um, to the cloud. Um, as architectural global deployment unit, our, ch our um, chair, we are in charge of ambition, design and implement the future global um, uh, platform that will support our core banking infrastructure as well as uh, core banking, um, uh, our business units and also um, our platform. So inside that uh, organization, uh, um, EAS and Open System uh, is in charge of design and implement that architecture. So we consider also important government and process as well as talent management. Um, we are building a, a new platform based on these uh, key principles. We want to create an infrastructure that is global at birth with a low cost and based on commodity infrastructure is software defined and open source and also reliable and data centric. So this took us to the use of OpenStack. And, and before uh, Lourdes will explain uh, what, how we uh, address the challenges of storage inside OpenStack, and we would like to highlight what we consider a very important thing, a key factor uh, that is aligned our organization with this new model. We have created multidisciplinary groups that work as a, a team and uh, we uh, work in a more collaborative way and agile way. So please, uh, Lourdes. Thank you very much, Luis, for sharing this information with us. So based on the key principles that Luis just explained, the BBVA storage team uh, translated those um, principles of designs into the following storage decision factors to build the properly storage platform within the OpenStack deployment. So the fact of having multiple deployments with multiple, multiple geographic distribution implies that the storage must provide a mechanism to propagate the storage configuration uh, design to all the countries in order to standardize the international deployments. Also, they will have multiple tenants, multiple, multiple applications, and multiple countries. So that implies that the storage must provide multi-tenancy capabilities in order to first isolate resources and also to design deployments that physically and locally uh, will have a separation of resources. They will also build a catalog of storage features to make intelligent provision decisions and be able to map the workloads and the services into the backend storage technology. Automation is key. So they will have an automation tool to not only to control and maintain the configuration of the cloud uh, infrastructure, but also to be able to, uh, to launch deployment and application in a very, very fast way. As part of the fundamental, uh, the design fundamentals, they need uh, storage, uh, enterprise storage features, such as eliminating single point of failures, minimizing the possibility of data loss, seamless scalability, and a high available architecture that ensures data integrity, data availability, and integrated data protection for backup and DR purposes. And finally, storage efficiency to reduce cost, consuming less space, taking less time, and reducing the data, the data traffic during the storage operations. Now, Peter will explain how NetApp is addressing those requirements with our technology. 
Hi, my name is uh, Peter Holcomb. I'm a working for professional services at NetApp Spain, and we're helping um, uh, BVA transition to OpenStack and their uh, digital transformation. Now, BVA is a global um, entity, and they want to have a global OpenStack. So, how they want to go? How did they go around doing this? They wanted to create a building block approach. So, they wanted to create a fully automatized, homogeneous um, uh, OpenStack region. And this region, they wanted to go ahead and they wanted to deploy in different open, in different regions. Okay, so they first built up their um, their OpenStack region in Madrid, Spain. They fine-tuned their building block and then they deployed it to uh, Mexico. Now Mexico has a caveat where it actually covers more countries within one single region in OpenStack. And now they're also deploying towards Turkey, future Argentina, as in other countries. Now, this building arc approach did not only allow them to create uh, regions in, in different countries, but it also allowed them to create regions within their own countries. So they created two um, OpenStack regions. They've created a production OpenStack region and a pre-production OpenStack region. Now, all these things are running actually on uh, data on tap. And since it runs on data on tap with a simple replication, they were actually be able to create a full DR solution to their, um, to their building blocks. So they have their production um, uh, region and their pre-production region connected with SnapMirror, and therefore they have their, their DR solution working. Now, how is this all set up? So they have their control nodes working on a uh, virtual storage machine within data on tap. And then they have another virtual storage machine for their Cinder, their Glance, and their ephemeral um, storage as well. So what are we doing? We're actually decoupling the, um, the data from the physical storage running underneath. This gives us data flexibility. So if we actually want to move information from one place to the other, we just have to use, move that SVM. And as we saw before, with a simple snap mirror, um, connection, we can actually move it to a DR site. Now, this also allows us to do um, seamless scalability. We can do scale out, we can scale up, and we can even scale down because we have a cluster, uh, cluster data on top, which allows this virtual um, flexibility. Not only that, for Mexico, we are creating a separate SVM per country. So, this also allows us to just, let's say, if Mexico um, they cover Peru and different, different countries. Imagine they set up another building block in Peru and they want to move their data there. Well, it's a simple snap mirror solution to move the data. We're only talking about data. Straight to, uh, they set up their building block and they cre create a snap mirror and they can move their data there. If they want to go to Amazon, if they want to go to Azure, then we can do the same thing. We connect to um, data uh, on tap cloud and we move the data up there. Okay? So, how do we do this in Mexico? How do we make um, the data se separate from, from to different SVMs? So what we're proposing to do is the following. We want to create um, private volume types within OpenStack, and we only have private volume types. Each country has its own project, its own tenant, and these tenants have their own private volumes. This means we will always create um, volumes within their own private SVM. So we always have separate data. Again, this allows for data, data flexibility. Now, um, one of the other things we, we, we had is that we're working with um, different backends, with different exports. And we found that when we create a, uh, a Nova instance with an attached volume, then uh, yeah, let's say we create a Nova availability zone one, then it would create a volume in any export, depending on the filter. It would uh, grow any export within the data, data on tap. But what they also wanted to do is incorporate some kind of storage availability zone too. So the thing we're working on now is to actually create different storage availability zones. Now, how were you doing this? Well, we, um, as you know, we have different um, Cinder uh, services. And one of the propositions we were doing is, why don't we create three different Cinder volumes, each with their own Cinder conf, conf and um, each of these Cinder, Cinder confs has its own, own backend, back i.e. creating different 
data um, storage availability zones and assigning a default availability zone per Nova node. Okay? What happens when we do this? That means that when we create a uh, new Nova instance with an attached uh, persistent volume, it will automatically create a volume directly in a storage availability zone under this. Okay? If you create it in a different availability zone, we will create uh, the, the new volume in a different storage availability zone. But this still allows us to have cross access of any um, uh, storage availability zone volume to any storage availability zone uh, Nova instance running on top of it. In case we lose the storage availability zone, then you can still do cross access to the storage availability zone that's under it. Okay. Now, let's talk a bit more about uh, why data on top, why we're using data on top, why we're using NFS. Now, one of the advantages of using um, NetApp and one of the advantages of using data on top is that it actually automatizes some, uh, automates some of the, um, the uh, attaching of volumes and creation of volumes. Now, let's, let's see how, how it normally works with a generic NFS driver. When a generic NFS driver creates a volume, it has to copy its instance from Glance, has to copy it up to Glance, pass it over to the cylinder control nodes. The cylinder control node has to later write it down on its NFS share. Okay? Now, what happens when you, have to, when you do this with the NetApp driver? We are able to we're able to um, slow down this process. So we're able to actually capture the, the creation of the volume uh, in the state and avoid copying the data up to glance using CPU, passing it to Nova, using CPU, passing it down to the Cinder export. So with the NFS driver, we can actually capture the process of creating a volume. We are able to copy the, the instance the, the volume straight to the cinder mount point, which is uh, underneath. We cache this volume, okay, creating an NFS cache, and this we then clone within the cinder. Okay? This is then attached to the Nova instance. Now, we're not occupying any space except for one copy of the, uh, of the volume, and not only that, we're not using any uh, network or CPU on the glance and on the cinder control node. Okay? Once we have this, um, this cache created, any future use will automatically clone, and again, it won't use any extra space to create these volumes. Now, space will be created once you start using these volumes. Any new changes will start using space, but before that, it won't. Okay? But not only that, the cinder driver is also capable of um, capturing any new creation of a uh, volume that exists in Glance. And let's say if it wants to create a different export or a different availability zone, it, the, sin, the, the NFS driver is still able to capture this and actually create the copy from the, um, from the already cached image on a different export. Okay, so if you don't have Glance living on the cluster, you still are able to use the copy offload features and it still copies to a different um, availability zone or a different export if it's in the same cluster. And again, we can clone from there. Okay? So now, let's put this in numbers. Okay, now this is actually from a TR that some, um, some of the guys at NetApp Corporate did. And uh, what we did here is, what they did here is they actually created um, a, uh, a single bootable volume uh, 60 big, uh, of 60 gigabytes, okay? And they did this 100 times with a concurrency of one, okay? This means they created one, then another one, then another one, and then another one. The average time it took to create the volume when, we, when it was used with a generic uh, Cinder driver was 743 seconds, while it, the when while we were using the NetApp's the NetApp um, NFS driver, it took only 32 seconds. Now the footprint, well, this is a 95% quicker than uh, if we use a generic driver. Now 
the footprint, how much did it occupy? Well, um, we did, uh, make 100 copies of something that's 60 gigabits uh, heavy. That's about six terabytes of space on the, uh, on the back end. But because we're cloning this, the actual footprint on, on, the, uh, on the on top, cluster data on top, was 87 gigabytes. Okay, so that's a 98% less storage. Okay, now we're talking about this when it's created. So it's only using the same blocks as, a, as, a, as it was before. Now, once you start using the system, you'll start be starting creating more blocks. But again, we've got a data on tap system running behind it, which means we've, we're deduplicating any new traffic we're creating there. Okay, so again, that's a 98%. Uh, uh, savings. Now, how is this all done? What, the, what they were doing in, in, in BVA is they, they uh, automated everything using Ansible. Now, how do we do this with, uh, uh, how do you help them out with, uh, with the data on top side? Is that we went ahead and we documented every single step that we did, and we created Ansible playbooks for every single creation. So we were able to um, create Ansible play, playbooks that help them create SVMs, lifts, and, and also for the, part, for the DR part, help them be able to, to execute the DR automatically. Okay. Now, next steps, we don't have time to look at everything here, but these are the things we're working on them with them at the moment. Lourdes? We are almost done. And we did it in, let's say, 19? Oh, 19. 19, 19, 19, 20 seconds. 19 minutes. So we cover the challenges and we explain how NetApp is helping uh, BBVA in the digital transformation journey. Um, before finish, we would like to thank the NetApp OpenStack team for their support and especially BBVA for counting on NetApp. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>